Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 50 of Radio Free Filler. For this show, we're continuing with the third installment of the musical play, The Changes Over Twenty Years. We'll warm up with a continuation of James's letter to Stephen, explaining the progression of his play. Dear Stephen, a few years would pass as the modern 1916 boy and girl reminisced fondly about what a great success the play was. Then we would see that it had been so successful that everyone in the whole town had been able to retire. I've been revising that section, though. I have to remove any mention of my father. I don't want him anywhere around or in my plays. We'll definitely need help with the musical transformation as well as the completion of the stage. Good luck, your cousin James. Dearest Jenny, I'm sorry I didn't write sooner, our play is coming along, but I'm going to need a little more help from my cousin James. Officer Petty says you are looking forward to the miracle of our success. Don't worry about a thing. Even Officer Petty says it will be a miracle. Your devoted Stephen. Well, that was the clever limbo section. Now it's time for Act 2, Scene 1, and some new characters. We'll start with Officer Petty waiting calmly in stage center. Now, I gotta do some sound effects. Here goes. Put, 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 put. Rattle, rattle, cough, wheeze. Oh, hello, officer. Hello, can I help you? Well, I was wondering... I'm afraid you'll have to move your automobile first. Well, that was what I was wondering about. Had you noticed the big pile of lumber that's blocking the roadway? Yes, they're doing some construction at the little inn there. That's funny. The only reason I took this road was that they were doing construction on my regular route. You'll have to move your automobile now, or I'll have to write you a $10 ticket for obstructing traffic. Obstructing traffic? Um, oh, all right, I'm not going to argue that one. Where can I put the vehicle to avoid the fine? Well, there's the little parking area next to the little inn. You can park there for a dollar an hour. A dollar? I'll move it right away, officer. Put, 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 put. Rattle, rattle, cough, wheeze. Nuts. Rumble, squeak, rumble, squeak, rumble, rumble. Well, I was able to push it anyway. How long will it take to clear away the lumber? Well, it's hard to say. They may have decided to take the weekend off. But it's only Thursday. They have a long weekend sometimes. But the parking will cost more than the ticket. What can I do? Well, the parking is free if you take a room at the little inn. Well, officer, I see that you're the sheriff here. And this is such a tiny town. I'll tell you what. I'll take that room at the inn, and I commend you for your ingenuity. 
I couldn't take all the credit. Business has been slow lately, and a small town's got to supplement their revenue in mysterious ways. I just enforce the laws, but I'll give you credit for being a good sport. Welcome to our little town. I hope you enjoy your visit. You'll want to check in with Harry or Ruth Little at the inn. Harry Little? Surely not old Harry Little from England, is it? The very same, sir. Now, now I will enjoy my visit. Hmm. I suppose I ought to be suspicious of anyone who knows Harry Little. But then, who am I to say? Even I know Harry Little. <laughs> In case you haven't figured it out, Act 2, Scene 3 takes place in the restaurant slash bar slash dark room slash public hall slash general store slash lobby of the Little Inn. We just stopped action so I could tell you. Uh, Harry still hasn't replaced that missing front door. Action resumes. Good afternoon and welcome to the Little Hack! Well, I'm not the man I used to be. Heck! Well, I'll be. I haven't seen you since the old stage days, Heck. And you, Harry Little, bad boy of the small time. You haven't changed a bit. And neither of you. Yeah, we're still both a couple of liars. I should have known you were behind that construction roadblock scheme. Why, I'm completely innocent. I was here behind the counter the whole time. Ha! Well, I'm here to get a room, then. Maybe I can help out with the cleanup operation to save a little time. Not a bit of it. Your visit is on me. Compliments of the house. As long as I'm in charge here. I heard that. What's the idea of giving away what we're barely hanging on to? Allow me to introduce the Mrs. Hack. And Ruth, dearie, may I present the man who wrote the song I sang on the night we met. No, really? Never grow up, never grow old? That was your song? Yeah, that was one of them. I wrote a lot of songs for Harry back in the day. That was quite a hit at the time. What have you written lately? A lot of songs that haven't been hits. I was on my way to Baltimore, back from New York, where I unloaded my latest batch of duds for the minimum contract fee. Hey, do you know who else is here? Hannah! You mean this fellow knows Hannah? Only slightly. I was married to her for a few years. That's show business. It's a funny thing now that I think of it. I met her some 20 years ago at the old pottery shop a few miles down the road. She was singing some ditty at the wheel, voice of an angel. So I took her to the city, and she performed my most successful songs. What's she doing here? She bought the old pottery shop from Jenny's father when he couldn't pay the doctor bills. It helped, but only for a while. It's strange, though. I never heard her talk about her singing career. I'm not surprised. The singing career was my idea. She made a lot of money for a couple of years, and I certainly got some good out of it, but she wanted to get back to her craft. Her heart was in her hands, not her voice. It was an amicable divorce. She mentioned that she was going to help out a family that was having trouble, but I didn't make the connection to this town. I thought I heard it, but I don't believe it. It's good to see you, Heck. Now I'm going to put you to work. They're trying to start a little theater in the back room, and there are a couple of kids who are trying to write a musical. I've left the music world behind me, but I've got the knack for making things, and I still remember how they used to set up the stages. You can be the big show doctor. Just leave me out of your old stories, all right? That should be easy. 
The young people these days aren't interested in the old stories. They don't even remember me. But I've got nothing better to do, so count me in. I'll be right back. I've just got one sack to bring in from the automobile. You drive an automobile? Oh, the change is over 20 years. Let me give you a hand with that sack. Well, I guess we'd better get back to it. Harry, you stay out front and try not to give the rest of the store away. Never grow up, never grow old, keep your spirits gay. That's a way to keep your art from getting old and grey. Time will come and time will go and things will pass away. But never grow up, never grow old, that's what I always say. A chance to meet a baby as he crawled across a rug. A darling little tyke, why he was cuter than a bug. I let him hear a chorus of this song I like to sing. And up he jumps and breaks into a perfect buck and wing. Never grow up, never grow old, keep your spirits gay. That's a way to keep your art from getting old and grey. Time will come and time will go and things will pass away. But never grow up, never grow old, that's what I always say. Next I met a working man, he had a heavy load He staggered and he struggled as he trudged along the road I let him hear a chorus of this song I like to sing And suddenly he's flying like a kite upon a string Never grow up, never grow old, keep your spirits gay That's a way to keep your art from getting old and grey Time will come and time will go and things will pass away but never grow up, never grow old, that's what I always say. At last I met a gazer leaning hard upon his cane. He asked me for a remedy to help to ease his pain. I start to sing a chorus, but he stops and thumbs his nose and drops down dead right on the spot, but that's the way it goes. Never grow up, never grow old, keep your spirits gay. That's the way to keep your art from getting old and grey. Time will come and time will go and things will pass away. But never grow up, never grow old, that's what I always say. Well, here's Act 2, Scene 3, with Stephen and Jenny standing at stage left, and they're holding up the opposite ends of an imaginary plank. Jenny, dearest, we are alone at last. Just you, me, and this wooden plank. Yes, this wooden plank, which we must hold up in its exact position until Hannah returns to nail it into place. It joins us together... Yet it keeps us apart. I think Hannah did it on purpose. <laughs> Why, Stephen, Hannah is a dear old friend of my family. When Mother's health began to fail, she would come by the house and look after me for hours on end. She even managed to keep up Mother's craft work at the same time. She kept me safe, happy, and out of mischief. Of course she did it on purpose. But at least we can see each other now. Yes, Hannah is a lot more generous than Officer Petty. Officer Petty? Why, she just stopped by to check up on things. I'm glad to see that plank is still in place. All right, you can put it down now. Definitely on purpose. Absolutely on purpose. You don't have to explain anything to me. I was young myself once. Stephen, Jenny, I have wonderful news. We have a visitor, an old friend of mine, and he's going to help us. Have either of you ever heard of Hack? Does he drive a carriage? 
A London cab? No, he's actually driving a used Model T these days, but he's really a songwriter. He wrote a lot of songs for, well, he used to be very good 20 years back. 20 years back. Why, that's perfect. He'll be just what we need for our musical play, which starts off 20 years ago. Go easy on the exposition, Eddie. I mean, Stephen. We all get it. Those are the heaviest potatoes I've ever seen. Thank you, Officer Petty. Would you like to take one with you? It makes a nice meal all by itself. Thank you, but no, I never take gifts while I'm on duty. I wouldn't want it on my conscience or on my stomach. Those are some heavy potatoes. But they only have eyes for you. Say, that's a good line. I must use that some day. Well, I must be about my rounds again. Now, Stephen and Jenny, you do what Hannah says. Remember, you're her responsibility. Let me introduce everyone. Hack, this is little Jenny, who I used to help look after when she was a little child. And this is her friend Stephen, who's working on a musical comedy play. Jenny and Stephen, this is Hack. How do you do, Hack? How do you know Hannah? How do I know Hannah? How do I know Hannah? Let me see. Hannah, how do I know you? Hack's here to help the two of you with your play. And look, he's brought this sack of potatoes. And this is no ordinary sack of potatoes. Allow me to introduce Mrs. Cook. Where? She's very handy. She helps me a lot, especially when I get one of my blinding headaches. Are the headaches getting worse? No, no, the headaches are getting better, bigger than ever. Then Mrs. Cook appears, and she helps me out, oh, so many ways. Every writer should have a Mrs. Cook. So, Mrs. Cook is the sack of potatoes? Well, yes, at the moment. I think I'll go see how Harry's getting along. Can you manage without me for a while? Yes, I think we have enough hands to continue working. Mrs. Cook is a very sturdy woman and she's always willing to help. We'll be fine as long as there aren't any robbers about. Mrs. Cook is terrified of robbers. Well, you just tell Mrs. Potato Cook that we have Officer Petty on hand. Robbers are the least of our worries. I'm going to go now. Now, Heck, why don't you and Stephen get to work on the play? Jenny and I will go over some of the decorations. Capital? Delighted! No, I mean, how are you set for capital? How much money do you have available for this play? Well, I have an agreement with a backer. I mean, maybe. It's hard to say. Oh, I've worked on a lot of those. What have we got so far? Well, here's the latest letter from my cousin James. Dear Cousin Stephen, I'm delighted to hear that you're getting some help with the construction. I hear that Hannah is very talented, and I'm sure that her sense of design and discipline will result in a splendid transformation for the little theater. As for the play itself, I'll be sending along some additional jottings under separate cover. Our remaining obstacle will be getting help, a lot of help, with the music. I haven't found anyone in town. It's a difficult combination, experience and a willingness to work for free. Good luck. Your cousin James. That sounds like quite a play. Count me in. Here, let me show you the earlier letters. That will help. Let's see here. Hmm. The changes over 20 years. Opening songs about life in the 1890s. A song announcing a birth. A song about not being born yet. Snowball Fight Ballet. Yeah, you know, there could be a song about that as well to lead up to it. Another song, another song, another song. Hmm. 
This reminds me of a time a few weeks ago. Really? In what way? I got a blinding headache then, too. Oh, dear. Shall I get a doctor? No, no. This is when things start happening. Oh, by the saints, it's good to be back out of the bag. Let me boil you up some nice hot potatoes. Let's see. I'll use some of the old recipe I brought over from County Clare. I'll just get the fire going here. Now, where did I put that pot? Ah, bless me, here it is. Now then, one, two, three potatoes. How many of us are there? Oh, there you are. Now, where was I? One for the lady, one for the boy, one for the pretty little Colleen, and two for the master. Won't you be joining us, Mrs. Cook? My lord, no. I've been breathing in nothing but potato ever since we got kicked out of West Orange. Ah, those Protestants. Well, never you mind. I'll just get that water boiling. That's better. Now some spices. Maybe a drop of the old medicinal, but not for the potatoes. There, that'll do for me. Now I just keep stirring the pot. I don't understand. Never interfere with the creative process. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, some of you may be wondering about Mrs. Cook in this scene. Some of you may be wondering if Hack is the only one who can see her. It might be safe to assume that she would be invisible to Jenny and Officer Petty since they don't know they're in a play. But what about Stephen? What about Hannah? I'll tell you right now, I have no idea. Here we got an empty stage with no scenery, no chairs, and no props. Oh, except the potato sack is real. But that's it. I'm not even sure how I'm supposed to handle the transitions from one scene to the next. I got two approaches I'm considering. Either dim the lights each time so the actors can get into position, or ask the audience to just shut their eyes for a few seconds and hope that they open them again. And now we've got characters saying, never interfere with the creative process. <laughs> This is very interesting. How much of this is yours? I play the hero, and Jenny plays the ingenue, and it will be a tremendous success. James is helping out by writing the parts where things happen and people talk and stuff. Have you got a villain? Apart from any backer who expects to be paid. Well, no, I don't think so. Will that be a problem? No problem at all. We can use Mrs. Cook. All righty now, everyone. Your potatoes are nice and hot. Here, let me get the plates. And here's a second potato for you, sir. Let me wrap it in a washcloth for you. There. Now you just place that nice warm potato on the back of your neck like you always do. Doesn't that feel better already? Draws out all the pain. Now the rest of you, just let them cool a little. My, that feels good. Thank you, Mrs. Cook. That'll be all for now. I'll pass the potatoes. Mrs. Cook will be the villain? Sure. Mrs. Cook can do anything. You'll see. Now, about the rest of the cast. Based on what I've read from James here, we'll need some singers. I know, a chorus of pretty girls. That'll be easy. There are a dime a dozen in this business, so we can save some money right there. It also says here that Officer Petty has a big black mustache. That was old Officer Petty, but he's dead. The Officer Petty you met is his daughter. Well, we can let her wear a false mustache. That'll work. Here, have your potatoes. Do you think she'll agree to appear on stage wearing a false mustache? Sure. I'll just tell her that this way she can keep an eye on all of us up close. As for the rest of the cast, most of them are supposed to be townspeople anyway, so we can drag a few of them from out of the audience each night. They'll love it. Isn't that kind of unusual? Well, you're a young man who hasn't been around much. The places I've been, I get to meet a lot of different people, and some of them have very new ideas. I'm always ready to try out new ideas. Why, some of those guys are 20 years ahead of the times. 
And speaking of time, that's all the time we've got for this week. But be sure to tune in next time for another installment of The Changes Over 20 Years on Episode 51 of Radio Free Filler.